everybody, 10 o'clock a.m. here at Pacific Time. Edible class begins now. Welcome, uh, thanks for joining us today. I'm uh, Trevor Cameron, our general manager here at Sunnyside. Say hi to Nicole, she's in the background with the pretty green screen. Good morning, everyone. Like I said, thanks for joining us today. The sun is out here in Western Washington. Um, I hear the word 80 today, 80 degrees, which is, uh, I think the new record by quite a few degrees. It is beautiful out. You can see the glare on my bald head here. It's a little warm in the greenhouse and I'm trying to squint to see. I should turn the desk the other way, maybe for tomorrow, we'll see. But uh, anyway, thanks for, thanks for joining us. I'm gonna show a little PowerPoint here in a minute and go through some pictures and, and uh, that'll be up uh, with the class. Hopefully everybody had access to the handout, Edible Landscapes, it's on our website. Um, it was sent out with the class on Wednesday. Um, if you can't find it or access it, just email us, let us know, and we can help you have the handout because there are some good uh, tips on there as well as we kind of go through the slideshow. Um, I'll start by saying, you know, this class kind of started a few years ago. You know, you're probably getting tired of seeing me on Zoom, but we've had berry class and fruit class and all these different edible classes. So this is kind of a compilation of all of them, little bits and maybe some other ideas on kind of how to turn your yard into utilizing more edibles. Um, you know, certainly it's kind of fun for me as I use these things in pots and in my landscape and shrubs and, and things I'll show you here in a moment. Uh, if I'm out in the summer doing a little weeding, you know, my boys are out playing with me in the yard, kicking the ball, we can run over and grab a quick snack out of the yard. So there's, it's kind of fun to have uh, some of these newer berries and blueberries and things um, mixed into our, our regular landscape and not Maybe like it was years ago when you had your yard and then you had a berry patch or a separate area where we had these these particular plants. So with that, I'm gonna start you here. Give me one minute here to start the slideshow. All right, so there we go. Edible landscapes, there's me if you figure out how it was already. We're gonna start uh, by talking about some different shrubs. So to me, you know, a classic good Pacific Northwest shrub is the blueberry. You know, maybe many of you have went out to the U-Pick farms or <clears throat> again, kind of done maybe some old school blueberries where we, what we call Northern high bush, you know, a big plant, maybe not the prettiest specimen in the yard, although they are still nice, um, great fall color. But, you know, breeding um, and a lot of our growers have come out with so many cool new ones that just, A, don't get as big. And frankly, if it didn't have blueberries on it, I think a lot of times you would think, boy, that's a really pretty shrub in the yard. So there's a program uh, called Bushel and Berry. You can find it online. We, we stock almost all their plants, um, you know, through the course of the season. But a few of the better ones, here's the first one, Pink Icing. You can see by the leaf color, you know, a really attractive shrub, but a very manageable size blueberry, you know, at about three feet by three feet. This is something I could grow in a pot, you know, use in my garden as a regular shrub, have an attractive plant, and then again, have the berries to eat on it as well. Uh, something like pink icing, you'll see the color there in spring when it's blooming, but it would turn some nice color in fall, but would typically not lose all of its leaves. If we get a, a usual winter here in Western Washington, um, haven't been too cold lately, they would hold on to leaves and kind of turn a, a turquoise to purple color. So we'd have a little bit of winter interest as well. Uh, here's a new one we just got in this year called Southern Bluebell. And I put the picture with it in the pot there because again, it's a great one. We could even tuck in a pot, use it on the patio in some decent sunshine. But again, if you looked at that plant, you wouldn't think blueberry, you'd think boxwood, you know, a little Japanese holly, uh, something that's very tight you know, symmetrical in shape. And again, it doesn't get very big. You know, Bluebell's got a delicious blueberry that we can eat, um, a nice mid-season producer, but it's also a very manageable size. You know, I can see this, you know, again, if, you, if you're going edible landscape, plant it in your yard, you know, as a low border shrub, a little hedge, you could clip it, you know, like you do boxwood. Um, and then again, have some berries on it to eat as well. Um, so think of kind of the other purposes that you could keep it in your yard in different locations. As long as I've got good sun, 
we've got all the acidic soil and everything else we need uh, to keep the blueberries happy. You know, a couple that we've had around these next two for a number of years, um, and I think make great landscape shrubs. I, I found this picture where you can kind of see somebody set it up just as a regular foundation plant. Um, this is Bountiful Blue, one of our best-selling uh, blueberries. You can see a little bit more of the blue-green color on the leaf, a delicious medium-sized berry in mid-season, uh, but a very, again, manageable size. This is something I'd expect to say shrubby like this. It's not upright like, like the old uh, high bush blueberries, but something maybe three feet tall, four feet wide um, that we could use, again, as a shrub in the landscape or even perhaps clip, um, you know, as a little hedge. Again, typically these hybrids would keep some foliage in the winter. Um, we'd have to get pretty cold for them to go totally dormant, but you would still see some, uh, some winter interest as well through the dormant months. The partner plant to that is Sunshine Blue. You know, and again, I, I picked a picture in a container because certainly we could grow all these blueberries I'm talking about day in, in a nice size pot. <clears throat> but Sunshine Blue is a perfect companion. Can you hit the type answer? You know, those are two. Uh, blueberries that would go together and cross-pollinate each other. We're always going to have better production if we have two different pollen sources on our blueberries. So if I you were down here shopping the day and you wanted to try these, I would tell you, okay, well, why don't we get, you know, two bountifuls and a sunshine to plant in a group of three, you know, or, or mix the two together. They look almost identical, the same growth habit, same berry, same season, nothing changes. Really, the only big difference is sunshine blue if we saw it in flower, the, the bloom is very pink, whereas the bloom on the Bountiful Blue is more white. So two great companion ones. Again, you're looking for that partial evergreen, manageable size, and an excellent producer here in our climate. Uh, the newest one uh, just came out this year from uh, Monrovia is called uh, Bountiful Delight. That's kind of the third member of that same genre. These won't keep their leaves. So this one, we would go dormant up here. They turn pretty red in the fall, drop their foliage and then start off. Again, a little bit darker berry. This one will have a little bit more flavor if you like the wild style blueberries. A little bit darker blue black color means to me, it's usually a little more complex flavor. But again, very manageable in size, you know, at three feet by three feet. And another one that we could mix in. Um, you know, this is one that was bred a little bit more for the south and will take the heat. So this one may be a little bit more drought tolerant than some of the other blueberries and one that I could put out in a real full sun location here and never worry about, you know, sunburn or, or too much heat. <clears throat> so being a being a southern hybrid, uh, maybe just a little bit, little bit more heat tolerant. Uh, jelly bean, I just took that picture last night at my house. There's my patio, you can see my orange pot. Uh, those are, that's jelly bean. I have two of them because I'm kind of a matchy matchy guy on the patio. But uh, there's my bright orange pot with about a 12 year old jelly bean in it. Um, you can't tell scale there, but that plant is under two feet tall and about two feet wide. Uh, we get an incredible amount of production on a little dwarf one like jelly bean. It's out of that same series, that bushel and berry series. Um, we, were, we will have these here in, in a few more weeks. We've been lacking them this spring but this is one we would have in here about mid-May finally, and we'll have lots of them. Um, again, if you're looking for a dwarf, I chose the container. I was at a yard room, but I could certainly grow this in my landscape as well on a very small uh, blueberry at two feet by two feet. I think this is the best dwarf one I've seen uh, come out if you really want to stay, stay small scale and again, have an excellent crop with, with really good flavor. So this is kind of the, the preview coming soon. I wasn't going to bring this up because we do not have them just yet, but I, you heard me just mention jelly bean. Uh, unfortunately, with COVID and everything happening last year, a lot of the growers lack staff, fell behind on planting times and taking cuttings and, you know, the rest, blah, blah, blah. I won't keep making excuses, but uh, we do have a lot of these plants secured to come in here. The first crop will be in mid-May. So the bushel and berry things, we have plenty of pink icing. We've got plenty of southern bluebell. Uh, some of these other ones I'm mentioning we'll have here very shortly. The brand new stuff I wanted to put in the slideshow because I think they're fun um, and we will have all these as well, that same time frame. Uh, Midnight Cascade and Sapphire Cascade are two brand new blueberries out of the bushel and berry series um, that frankly almost weep. They were bred 
for a very short kind of semi weeping habit. Um, I've seen demos of them in hanging baskets um, or a very low blueberry, almost like a ground cover. Again, excellent production. Uh, the Midnight Cascade would be a little more of that native style with a little bit darker blue black blueberry, a little more complex flavor. Sapphire blue would be our typical bright cobalt blue blueberry. Um, but both those I think are gonna be real fun for gardeners to play with as part of the ed edible landscape. Um, or again, to me, trying a hanging basket. I'm probably gonna try that this summer. Uh, the new bush one coming out is called Silver Dollar. And they called that because honestly, the foliage looks a little bit like eucalyptus. It's got kind of a silvery green color to it. It's perfectly round, like the Silver Dollar eucalyptus would be. Um, and again, an excellent mid-season blueberry with good flavor that we can grow on a much smaller scale. That's another one that I would go straight for a pot or a very small landscape plant, or again, that really nice low uh, clipped hedge or a little border plant that we'll be able to eat as well. So watch for those in May. Um, if you would like, you can email your name or when you're down here shopping, just let us know. We put you on the want book. We've already got a list going and, and we'll let you know when they come in. Uh, finally, I kept mentioning Northern Highbush blueberries and I kind of wanted to fill those in too because just because we have um, you know, all these new flavors that are more manageable size, maybe a little bit more attractive. There are certainly places in our edible landscape for uh, regular high bush blueberries. You know, these are the tall four, five, six, even seven foot plants. Um, we had a beautiful hedge of it growing up as a kid in our yard. My parents surrounded our down lower garden that was a little wetter with blueberries. It made a great, great time to go. Sure, Dad, I'll go pick, I'll go clip the hedge and pick some blueberries. Um, so you can see two pictures there kind of a a blueberry hedge it's nice and thick with all the berries out these turn beautiful colors in the fall and then drop drop their leaves like you can see on the right so i wouldn't have an evergreen hedge but certainly a nice barrier um, that i could use as a hedge um, and and again eat you know eat part of that edible landscape lots of varieties of high bush out there just again as a reminder if you weren't at the berry class make sure especially with the high bush that we always pick two different varieties to mix in this hedge or in our garden. So we have cross pollinization between two in the same season. That way we maximize our crop. Uh, some other kind of shrubs that I would look at adding um, in the Pacific Northwest here in Western Washington, uh, love evergreen huckleberry. I didn't take a picture of the berry. If you've seen huckleberries out in the woods here, they grow native in sun and shade on the beach in the woods, just about anywhere. Um, it's a great evergreen shrub. This is one that would not lose its leaves. And I wanted to take this picture intentionally because you can see the leaf color. So this is a plant to me, nice small leaves, again, kind of boxwoody, but I would have really nice orangey red new growth, adds attraction in the landscape. And then again, I would get towards that mid, late summer into fall, and I would have those great little uh, dark huckleberries to eat. They're not huge, but they're delicious. If you like ice cream, they're really good with those. Uh, but that's another one to kind of look at using in the landscape, you know, part shade, part sun, sun. You could really grow these just about anywhere. Um, and again, being native, it's easy in the Pacific Northwest and um, part of our edible scheme too. Uh, this is one I found a few years ago. Um, they would call box huckleberry. This would be native over more in the Appalachians, the Midwest, a little bit on the East Coast. But this would have the same delicious huckleberry we're used to on a very low evergreen. So if I'm looking for a nice filler plant, maybe in my edible landscape, not quite ground cover that low, but say a foot and under turns beautiful red, holds its leaves through the winter. So I'd have some winter interest, but this, uh, they call it buried treasure, um, uh, huckleberry or box huckleberry, uh, would be one I could utilize as a nice mass planting, use as a ground cover again, a little shrub let we'll call it, not so flat as a ground cover, but but again, not very tall, um, something I would get again, some excellent uh, berry production off of as well. Uh, lingonberries, you know, another great one with ice cream, but uh, lingonberries are another one that's a great Northwest berry. Um, you know, obviously being a Scandinavian native, very similar climate, uh, they take some cold, they take some shade, they take some sun if we water them. Uh, you can see the delicious berries there on a nice patch I found a picture of, but one again, um, you know, that we would always get really good production on, keep our leaves in the winter, 
stay very short. You know, typically lingonberry won't go to over a foot tall. And I can use as again, a great little border shrub or a mass planting area um, that's attractive to me in the landscape and the bonus of, of something to eat on it as well. Uh, goji berries kind of gaining some traction up here. Um, you know, this is a bigger plant. This is not one we would probably grow right by the front door or along the driveway, but something we could use. It's a really cool plant kind of as a specimen shrub, you know, in the background. Goji berry is so fertile. Uh, wildlife doesn't touch it if you fight deer. Um, it's one of those super fruits. You've got all kinds of antioxidants and vitamin this and vitamin that. Uh, that's one of those craved berries around these days at markets. Uh, but it's very easy to grow. If you've got good sun, you've got good drained soil, um, it might be one worth trying out. You can see, if you saw a plant, it's kind of got a big arching habit. I've even seen some folks train these on walls as almost an espalier. It's not a vine, but you can almost have that look to it if you train it the right way. Um, and certainly, again, something I'll get a massive amount of fruit on or berries on here um, as we get into that mid-late summer and they ripen. Uh, honeyberry, same thing. Everybody's wanting uh, to grow their own these days. Um, honeyberries in the, the honeysuckle family, uh, they call them hascaps. They've got a bunch of different names. Uh, these are extremely cold hardy um, and take a lot of heat. So this is one we could put out um, in the garden, uh, depending on the variety we choose, and use it as a nice shrub that I would get um, really good tasting berries off of. It kind of looks like a elongated blueberry. It's got a Kind of a similar flavor but it, it adds in a little tart too so it's, it's kind of a di little different flavor than typical blueberry um, make sure again this is one we have to have cross pollinization on so if you choose honeyberries in your edible landscape uh, make sure we get two compatible varieties that ripen at the same season so we can have the bees do their thing and we've got maximum production on both plants um, be careful when you choose your varieties on these there's a really wide range of growth habits. Most folks that I talk to want to stay a little bit lower. They don't want a massive plant. Others that have room want a big old specimen. So we can find honeyberry varieties starting in that three, four foot range and other tall ones would get up there six or seven feet. So kind of pick your the size that you would like for your own yard. You know, if we, we kind of talk a little bit about edibles and containers, um, you know, I think most gardeners and I'll raise both my hands have plenty of empty pots behind their house. And it's like, hmm, what should I do in that one? We could grow something edible in it. You know, something simple as an herb, a vegetable, a berry, you can grow anything in a pot, you know, if we pick the right, the right soil and the right fertilizer. So again, you saw in my patio, um, I wish I got to eat more. My sons usually take most of them, but I've got two blueberries in pots. And I just mentioned these lines as you can go back and, and review this class but make sure you use the right potting soil. You know, blueberry loves acidity. And when I swapped from typical organic potting soil and went to our uh, azalea camellia acid mix, which is again, a good potting soil or an amendment that I can plant in the ground, um, that my blueberry production doubled the next summer. So if you're gonna set blueberries up in pots, don't just go by soil. Like to me with most all gardening, it's all about the soil. If we've got happy dirt, we use good products, we're gonna have success. So try using an acid potting mix like we have here at the store. Your blueberries are gonna be very happy. And then we go back and feed it with rhododendron food. We always keep that acidity up and we've got happy container blueberries long-term. You know, look at strawberries. You know, I have mine these days in big pocket planters. You know, I like some nice glazed pottery out in my landscape mixed with shrubs and other plants. Um, so I have mine right out in my garden. They're not in a separate patch. I don't grow them in a box. We certainly can do that too, but I just wanted some nice strawberries for the family to eat off and on through the summer, fall. So I've got pocket planters that I use to plant mine in. Strawberries don't need the acidity, so I can use the regular good Edna's Best organic potting soil and then supplement it with the little fruit berry vine food. And I've got happy plants year after year after year. You know, strawberries are run out of gas you know, mother plants, they call them in three or four years. So as long as I'm careful to replant my pots every three or four years or pull those existing plants out, divide them, I can recycle some of my starts and keep my production going uh, long-term. Hanging baskets, a lot of folks doing strawberries and hanging baskets. There's some great varieties that we can plant in a nice hanging basket, have those dangle off the sides, and simply just reach up and, and pick a nice berry. 
Plus, I think a lot of the newer strawberries, like Berry Treasure, there's a, there's a, a, a number of them, uh, have really pretty flowers. It's not just our typical white flower, red strawberry. There's a lot of pinkish red blooming ones now that I think look attractive as a hanging basket anyway. Plus, again, we get to eat them as part of our edible landscape. Um, and then finally, again, the ground cover. We can always set up strawberries, you know, edging our raised gardens, using them in the garden as a ground cover. Um, there's a lot of places that we can we can we can use, utilize strawberries. Raspberry shortcake. You know, if you were going to do a a raspberry, you know, typical raspberries are in in tall rows, and and raspberries always run. So I don't have, you know, a magic answer for you to keep them contained. They're very easy to grow along a fence line or in a raised garden. We perhaps can keep the roots a little more contained, um, but certainly you could use in the landscape. The one I mentioned in particular, the raspberry shortcake, is a little dwarf without thorns. So I'm not going to bleed to death when I'm picking my raspberries, and I'm going to have a very small scale plant with, with the delicious uh, berries on them here as we produce. Raspberry shortcake's a June bearer, so I'd have a nice crop in that June, early July time frame, and then the next season as well. Um, this is another one, again, a great one to, to grow in a pot because it is shorter. I just have to remember every few years in the winter, I'd pull that plant out of the container, divide it, plant some back in my pot and either make more, you know, share with the gardeners, plant them in the ground. You know, there's a lot of other things we can use them for. Um, for me, I was out of vegetable garden space, so I do my potatoes in pots is the next one on there. I've seen folks to you know, buy garbage cans and cut the bottom end of it off and stick it on the ground, fill it full of soil. You can grow great potatoes in a, in a lot of different containers. I have little Velcro sacks that are about 20 gallon size. Some Yukon Golds, do some Chieftains. You can pick your favorite potatoes, but very easy to grow uh, to me in, in containers as well in the landscape and not necessarily uh, in the raised bed or the actual garden. Summer vegetables. You know, we're kind of warm this week, so it's hard to say we don't have tomatoes or peppers or anything yet. It's still too cold because it'll be too cold at night again next week. Um, but that's a great way to me to plant a vegetable garden, which we'll talk about here in a little bit, and have some things in the ground. And, and again, maybe I don't have room for the massive tomato. You know, get a big 15-gallon pot, you know, something cutesy. You know, I've used all kinds of containers over the years to grow tomatoes in. I can keep those separate from my vegetable garden and frankly control the fertilizer, how much it gets watered, make sure it's got good air circulation and maximum sun. And to me, I think you can grow a superior tomato sometimes in a pot versus the ground if we can control the, the culture a little bit more. Um, you know, anything can grow in a pot, like I mentioned earlier, anything in the appropriate size pot, we use the right fertilizer, the right soil, we're gonna have success. You know, tomatoes I mentioned in the pots, you know, I've even seen them growing as hanging baskets. We do a few here a year, but there's some real fun cherry tomatoes, maybe some smaller ones. It's tomatoes of vine. You know, we can plant it in the container, get it up off the ground on a hook, and then let it trangle down and walk along and, and pick those tomatoes and not have to necessarily cage it or plant it in the garden like we have traditional ones. Um, you know, and again, themed herb pots. I think the ladies here at Sunnyside uh, do a great job with herbs. We carry a huge selection up there that we can incorporate into our yard, um, again, or containers. And I think it's kind of fun sometimes they'll set up, you know, the Italian, the Mediterranean, the Greek, you know, and, and kind of do a little herb pot for you to take home that's got three, four, five, you know, different things in it that as they grow, you can utilize for culinary use, you know, bring them in when you're cooking certain dishes. Um, you know, out in the landscape for herbs, you know, a lot of rosemary growing as shrubs. You know, that's one of my favorites. It just finished blooming. It's a really drought tolerant plant that I could use even in a parking strip or a real hot spot in my yard. It's an attractive plant to grow um, and I would be able to use it again um, for, for cooking use as well. Um, you know, just a quick, you know, kind of tree discussion because I think a lot of folks are looking to add fruit. You know, we are decimated on fruit trees. We got more than we ever have and everybody's home growing things these days. So we're getting low, um, but we still have some nice ones here and we'll have a huge crop again next January uh, come in bare root. But, you know, I would recommend you really look at the fruit tree. I see a lot of stores, 
that are not going to sell you success. You know, I'm, I'm not going to knock on Costco or anybody else, but typically the varieties of trees we see at the box store or the chain store are not good ones for Western Washington. I'm sorry, they, they should not even be grown here. Um, so, you know, come to a place like Sunnyside. You know, we've got all Western Washington fruit and we try to get the smaller rootstocks is a huge part of this. Again, edible landscape. Everybody wants fruit. I don't want to have a fruit tree take up an old standard tree grow 40 feet by 40 feet. I can't get up and pick it. It shades my whole garden. I don't have the room for it in a typical city lot. So if I look for dwarf varieties of these different fruits, or even in the case of apple, a mini dwarf, very easy way to grow a tree in a small area. You know, I can keep those trees down in the 10 or 12 foot range with good pruning still get great production, but have a very small landscape tree. You know, as you're picking or considering, you know, I'm assuming all of you care about your yard because you're on class, and B, you're probably interested in adding some edibles in your garden. You know, as you're planning out where you're gonna put them, just keep in mind with fruit, we a lot of times have to have two different varieties of apple to cross pollinate or I don't get fruit. Two different kinds of pears or I won't get fruit. Some of the plums, some of the cherries, you know, there's plenty of self-fertile type fruits too, but with apples and pears in particular, we always have to make sure we've got two different varieties to cross-pollinate, then we get fruit on both trees. You can see that next thing, utilize combination trees, and that's a, an easy solution for edible landscapers as they want to add fruit trees. I don't have room, you know, for two apples, two pears, two plums, two of this, two of that. I'm looking to, I have room for three trees and I want all of it. Well, great, let's get, get you a combination tree, which our grower has taken a trunk and grafted four or five different apples onto one tree. Now I've got my cross-pollinization taken care of and I've got a happy apple long-term that I'll get great production on. Um, you know, always with fruit, to me, pay attention to sun, pay attention to air circulation and pay attention to drainage. Not a lot of fruit. Apples and pears can take a little bit more wet and some heavier soil. Other things want good drainage. We don't want heavy clay. Make sure we've got great soil to have a great tree. Um, and air circulation is huge with me. Don't pack, you know, six trees in an area that you only have three for. If we don't have sun and we don't have air moving through that little mini orchard area, we're going to be fighting diseases and typical issues because we don't have the air circulation of the sun a, to ripen our fruit and B, to keep them healthy without having to spray so much, okay? Um, so there's your answer right there early on. It's a lot of the classes you hear me talk about. I'm always saying, be honest with yourself as a gardener. You know, are you going to do a little spraying? Are you gonna prune it? Are you gonna take care of it? Or are you gonna plant it and walk away and maybe not have the best success? So um, be honest with yourself. If you're gonna have time, uh, to take care of these things, easy additions that don't need a whole lot of work if you can just donate a little bit of pruning time in the winter and then watch the spray as we go through the season so that we don't have bugs and disease. We'll have great fruit production in the summer to fall. And always use natural stuff. You know, this is an edible class. You're all going to eat everything you, you we're talking about today. Don't ever use systemics. Make sure you use natural organic type sprays and with me fertilizers as well to make sure I've got the best eating quality that, that I can. You know, another area that sometimes I hear a lot of customers ask about, you know, is the fence line, you know, the back of the property, you know, what do I do? I wanna add some edibles on there. Um, you know, there's some fun things to me that you can add on to fence lines or the border, the property line um, that can grow and do really well to get your production in the, in the edible garden. You know, I'll show you some pictures here in a minute, but, you know, look at a spalier type fruit trees. That's a great way. We sell a bazillion of them these days for gardeners to add a manageable size fruit tree that's grown in tiers that I can simply train along a fence, a wood fence, a chain link fence. I can train it in my garden if I add some poles and not have a tree, but have more of a lateral growing tree that I can totally control the height with pruning. I can keep this six feet tall, my fence for all eternity if I prune it right and take care of it. Apples and pears, a great way to do espaliers like that. Look at the pole apples. You know, another one that I don't want a tree that's going to get so large, I want something narrow. I could even grow in a, you know, a big whiskey barrel pot, you know, or a small spot off my patio and pick some apples. There's some great columnar apples 
Golden Sentinel, Scarlet Sentinel. I'll show you some pictures of those as well um, that I can grow in a narrow space. And again, they're kind of branchless apples. I don't have a lot of spread. I'm just gonna have that telephone pole look uh, with heavy production again. I uh, love kiwis around here. We've got a beautiful kiwi here on the property, a fuzzy kiwi um, planted on the nursery we could show you. But a kiwi is a, a great vine that if I've got good sunshine, a uh, kiwi is a delicious fruit to eat. I can choose either fuzzy kiwi or hardy kind of grape kiwis um, and have those growing on my, my fence, my arbor, you know, a shed, any kind of structure I want. Again, as part of my edible landscape. And the same grapes, you know, there's, there's some beautiful table grapes that we can utilize here in Western Washington or wine if you like to wine um, and grow grapes here and there. Again, on a, a small trellis, a fence, you know, some sort of structure that I can train it up and grow as a vine. It's a very attractive plant. And plus, I'm going to get some delicious grapes to eat on as part of my landscape as well. So there's a couple kind of ideas I, I found for espaliers. Um, you know, to me, the one on the left there with the pear, you know, a typical garden. Somebody's got a wood fence. They want to grow fruit laterally along there. They've trained it beautifully into tiers. I could still garden off the front of that as part of my garden, but I've got some delicious fruit that I can start picking here in that late summer fall period. I think the apple is a great example. I see a lot when I'm driving around in neighborhoods here, visiting people at home. Um, everybody's got a tiny little narrow strip in the driveway. You know, they've got a fence, the property line. I, what do I do here? I'd, I'd like to put something in and not just have a foot wide strip of dirt. Sweet, you know, let's plant some espaliers. We could train those absolutely flat um, along a fence with the structure, have beautiful apples to eat all season. And again, with the espalier, it's just like the combination uh, we talked about. When you buy espaliers here at Sunnyside, I'm gonna have three tiers. Each one of them is a different variety of apples. So I've got my pollinization taken care of with just planting the one. You can see the pole apples there. You know, there's a picture of the gold sentinel and the scarlet sentinel. We carry a number of other varieties as well, but that's again, you can see how I'm getting fruit literally on the trunk. I could grow that in a pot if I wanted or a very small spot in my garden um, and not have again a tree but I'd have a great high quality apple to eat on a very narrow specimen size. Most of these columnar ones, yes, I might get up 10 or 12 feet as I get an old one, but I'm still only gonna be two or three feet wide. Some of the kiwis we mentioned, you know, again, for years with kiwi, we had to worry about the he and get the she and the he and the she do their thing. When they both start blooming, then I get production. Um, I think it's a hard one for gardeners because they end up not buying both or they're not sure what they have. They bought a house. I got a kiwi. I never get fruit. What is it? We can never tell, you know, what if you have a he or a she kiwi unless we're in bloom and we go back to kind of old uh, botany class and we look for either a pistil or a stamen. That's the only way we're going to tell which flower you have. And then we could, of course, add the other, uh, the other one you're missing to get fruit. I'm showing you these two here because... Uh, a place like Monrovia that we do a lot of business with is trying to make our life easy as gardeners. I don't have to worry about buying a named female and a male. I just buy one plant. So the Sweet and Solo is a newer fuzzy kiwi that we would find the grocery store, uh, gets great production on it, but I have the male and the female set together right there on one plant. So I can plant a vine let it grow for a few years, it starts to bloom and I've got fruit forever. I don't have to worry about a second plant. Same with Kiwi Magic. You can see the fruit looks a little different on that one, but that's our grape or our Guta Kiwi. So a little bit hardier, those I can grow all the way up north uh, in some really cold temperatures and still have a happy plant. But that's one I would get a zillion smaller Kiwi, same great taste, doesn't have the fuzzy skin, but just as useful to me in the edible landscape. And again, the Kiwi Magic would be the variety I would have both sexes covered with one plant. I don't have to worry about getting two different varieties like we used to. A couple grapes, you know, again, lots of different grapes you can, you can grow here in Western Washington. Be careful which ones you choose. Um, some of them need a little bit more heat east of the mountains or a little bit more cold in the winter sometimes, but we try to stick with great, seedless or slipskin table grapes. 
So these are kind of a few of my all-time favorites that we typically have around. Uh, Hemrod and Interlochen are two great green ones. You know, we can't grow Thompson seedless that you buy in the grocery store. That's down in the heat in California, but we can have other comparable ones that would do very well in your landscape, allow you to have again a nice attractive vining plant, great fall color on them. We can prune them back hard every year um, and have a really manageable plant to add to the, the edible landscape that's gonna give me delicious grapes to eat fresh all through the, the summer and the fall. A couple darker ones, uh, Canadese and Reliance, these would be two of the red seedless types. I think we've got still a few of, of these around. Uh, we will be getting more grapes in. We're getting pretty low, but, but there will be some more grapes here available here pretty quick. But there's a couple of good uh, red seedless options for you. Um, last thing we'll kind of talk about is raised beds here in vegetable gardening. We had a great vegetable class here a few weeks back for the cold season. You're more than welcome to go back and watch the video. It gets a little bit more in depth with vegetable gardening. But, you know, the first step to me is I call to join the raised bed craze. Everybody is building raised beds. Everybody wants to garden off the ground, make it easier on the back, make it easier to contain my vegetables or whatever I'm growing in a raised bed in some sort of area. Uh, I'll show you some pictures of some cool designs I've seen, uh, but really an easy way to kind of build up a nice area in the garden and dedicate it to growing herbs, vegetables, berries. You can grow just by anything uh, up in a raised bed and keep it out of the, out of the regular garden. Um, lots of different materials to use. You know, there's great kits I've seen. Uh, we've got some really fun cedar ones around here. We've got barn tin. We've got all kinds of fun ones uh, that you could try, you know, as a way to, 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 to demo a little raised bed in your own landscape. Like I mentioned, vegetable, herbs, really anything. You know, I've had some customers do their dahlias in raised beds. You can grow perennials. I mean, you can grow anything you want uh, raised up in, in some of these raised beds. You know, to me, the key you know, again, is always soil, you know, set it up with a really good soil mix and always replenish it every season, particularly if you're doing vegetables and things like that. We want to go back every spring, re-add lime, add some fresh soil booster, compost, anything to add nutrition to that soil, mix that in, you know, four, six inches down and then boom, we're ready to plant a new crop of seeds, a new crop of seedlings and off we go for another year. So always uh, replenish the soil. We don't just fill a raised bed. It looks great for a year. Everything grew great. The next spring we plant it in there and things are not going to grow quite as well. We need to continue to feed them and feed that soil with the soil booster, chicken manure. We can go on and on. There's a lot of good organic amendments that we could add uh, to replenish it. Um, you know, make them big enough to grow what you like. You know, there's not a simple battle plan for a four by eight raised garden. Maybe you want something bigger. I've seen all kinds of shapes and sizes. They can be fun, you know, kind of show your style and use your imagination. You know, here's a couple, um, you know, I kind of found and pillaged some pictures of some different ones I've seen. Um, you know, obviously a simple wood design there, you know, where I can use anything uh, treated wood, cedar, there's no more poison anymore in treated wood. So I don't have to worry about, you know, even using something like two by six or two by 12 or anything. I can make myself brackets or posts to get the corners nice and tight. You can see that person's tried to cut down their weeding and it's a great way to put chips or rock or mulch or something in between the walkways uh, to keep your maintenance down a little bit. The one on the right uh, is gonna be a little spendier uh, with the barn tin or the galvanized added, but those are really cool. I mean, that to me is a really nice high-end raised bed. Looks very modern yet still fits into me with the country. You can see the barn in the background. Uh, but a really nice, you know, permanent type raised bed that I can grow some some fun vegetables in. Uh, something like stone, you know, or brick is, is what I had, a massive one for years. I dissembled it, making some smaller ones this season. But if I had uh, something like a, you know, curved stone or rock, I mean, I really could build anything I like above ground. And certainly something like that is going to last for all eternity. I'm never going to decompose or have to replace boards down the road if I go with something like stone or concrete or different substance. Um, this one on the right there, again, is, is, is simple cedar. But I, I love the brackets. We're trying to find more of these. But this came in a really easy-to-do kit. You know, you go by the wood and you've got these prefab uh, core tan 
uh, type braces that we would just lock on the four corners. It allows me to build up with some height and have a really cool kind of artsy border on them. We had the carrots before. I've seen everything from hummingbirds to little frogs to all kinds of fun stuff. Uh, as far as the design and the metal, uh, check back because we're still looking for these and I would hope we have some of this in to kind of help you out with the, with the raised bed product. You know, finally, vegetable gardening. You know, again, I mentioned, go back and watch our class. You know, this is a, a vegetable gardening we could probably have a whole series on. Um, but if you wanted a few tips for me, what I try to do in my yard um, is rotate my crops. You know, maximize my space. You know, a lot of yards are limited. Excuse me one second. A lot of yards are, are limited for space. And I want to maximize, again, my, my production in the vegetable garden. So rotating crops through, most of the times you can get away doing three plantings a year here. You know, we had our first vegetable class, cool season veggies. You know, in Washington, you know, we can be out sometimes even in late February to early March and we start planting cold crop things. You know, peas and lettuce and cabbage, a lot of greens, radishes, carrots, beets, you know, goes on and on. It's a great time. I can start that spring. You know, even if I do seed, typically I'm going to have 60, 70, sometimes up to 90 days for production. Well, if you do the math, that gets me from that early March period. Now I'm in early June. And now I can start adding in, you know, peppers and tomatoes and cucumbers and zucchini and a lot of the things that love heat, that it's frankly still too cold at night to put a lot of those things out here in spring. You know, then we get towards the fall time in that early August, I'm sorry, late August, early September time frame. Now I can go right back with my third planting and go back to the cool season things. You know, at our yard here, we're typically still picking snap peas and carrots and all that stuff way into October, sometimes early November, depending on what the weather does. Um, you can almost get it year round. You know, you'll have a little gap you know, in the dead of the winter, if we had a frost cover, maybe a little, uh, you know, cover for these raised beds in particular, I can almost keep them going year round. A couple of my neighbors do, and they're still harvesting in the winter time. But if you think of those three plantings, I think you can, you know, maximize again your production through the entire season with, with fresh vegetables. You know, to me, again, tomato cage is a tomato cage. They're easy, you know, but if, you know, you want to get a little more cutesy in the landscape, you know, grow something like that, you know, on an obelisk or a trellis. Um, they're really easy to train, cucumbers, zucchini, pumpkins. We can go on and on. Instead of just letting it trail on the ground, you know, do something fun with it. You know, you could grow it up and tie it to things, get that fruit off the ground level um, or the vegetable and still have a great, great way to maximize the sunshine and kind of, again, add it to the landscape without having it look, you know, quote unquote, like a, an old vegetable garden. You know, we can kind of have fun doing some different trellises and obelisks and stakes, you know, again, depending on what your style is. Um, you know, again, always replenish the soil. We talked about that with raised beds, but as you go through these crops of vegetables, keep adding fertilizer. You know, our, our organic, you know, tomato and vegetable food from EB Stone is gonna be high in calcium, which fights off disease, but it's also got all the little micronutrients and things that these plants need for success. So if we keep adding fertilizer every six weeks, you know, when we plant the next crop, add another batch of fertilizer. Don't be bashful uh, with the organic food. It's something that will never burn these plants, but we'll keep adding all the, all the, the, uh, the elements we need in the soil for successful vegetables. Um, you know, again, I mentioned it eight times already, always go natural and organic with your sprays. We don't want to ever get systemics or anything chemical near our edible gardens in the particular vegetable here. Uh, we wanna stay safe and natural so we can go out and pick fresh and eat right on there. Um, and again, containers, you know, I can grow anything in a pot. I've said that three times too, but think of that for your, if you're out of space in your little vegetable area, man, I'd really like to add more of this, but I don't have room. Well, sweet, take the tomatoes or the peppers out of there, grow them in pots there in the landscape nearby. If you've got good sun, you watch the water on them, keep them fed. You're going to have just as much success as in the ground. And to me, I think even more because we're, you're really allowed to, to control the water and the fertilizing on those particular plants. So thanks again for joining us. Um, 
you know, SunnysideNursery.net, that's our website. Nicole does a fabulous job uh, keeping up to date. There's a lot of information on there, a lot of pictures. Uh, certainly visit our website, which is probably how you found out about this class. And there's our email there. So if you've got questions from the class, you know, you want to shoot us a note about anything gardening, you know, feel free to email us anytime. Okay. So let me stop my share here. And with that, we're gonna we're gonna turn it over for some questions. I'll just mention, um, you know, tomorrow I'll be back at eleven. If you're not tired of listening to me yet, we're trying a new class tomorrow called Colorful Shrubs. I've got a fun uh, slideshow. We're not gonna spend a lot of time on rhodia, azalea, roses, hydrangeas, the typical things I think most gardeners know about, and that we have specific classes on here coming up on the schedule. This will show a lot of the other things that maybe we would utilize. Uh, different areas in our yard. So certainly feel free to, to join me tomorrow for a colorful shrub class at 11 a.m. So I'm going to turn it over to Nicole. She's going to tell you about our special this week and then we'll do some questions. Yeah, so we've got um, for all class attendees starting today and through Friday, which is, oh my gosh, the 23rd. We're already almost through this month. Um, we're offering 20% off all berries. All you need to do is just let us know that you were part of the class and we'll get you that discount. And then there's two different types of uh, raspberries, right? Yeah, the pink blueberries. icing. Blueberries, Bl thank blueberries. you. <laughs> Sorry, words. The pink icing blueberry and the um, southern bluebell that he talked about today, they're both in two gallon pots. We have those on an extra special discount as well. Um, so hopefully you can stop by the nursery, enjoy the sunshine and grab some of those delicious berries to put in your edible landscapes uh, at a great price too. So um, so I have a little bit of a confession. I've had a secret weapon behind the scenes here with me today. Um, the owner of Sunnyside Nursery, Mr. Steve Smith, AKA the Whistling Gardener has been helping to answer questions behind the scenes. So he's answered a lot of them. It's his first class with us and he's um, excited to share a lot of his knowledge. So we got a lot of those answered, which is really great. So thanks, Mr. Smith. Um, but we do have some ones to talk about. So you talked a lot about growing in containers. How do we choose the right container for the plants that we discussed today? Well, well again, I mean, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think a lot of it's going to do with your personal taste. I mean, obviously we can go on the cheaper end and get a, you know, plastic pot. You know, we sell a bazillion black 15 gallon pots here a year for folks to take home and plant a tomato in for the year, whatever they want. Um, it's probably up to your taste. You know, for me, you saw my picture, I want something maybe a little nicer that will last forever. So I'm going for a really nice frost proof uh, container that I can use for my entire lifetime as long as I don't drop it. Um, it could be any any surface. I mean, I've seen, you know, different, you know, cattle troughs, you know, if you like galvanized, we could, we could use cedar. I mean, it could be any container you want. Um, I would, if, you know, if you're curious, you know, come talk to me or the staff you know, A, I would ask you, what do you want to grow in it um, so we would get the right size? I mean, we're not buying a little 12 inch pot and expecting to grow a blueberry in there long term. So we're, you know, I'm kind of more in the two foot by two foot um, neighborhood for most all the things we talked about. If I want a decade, you know, out of, out of a happy blueberry, I'm going to be looking for something a little bit larger that I don't have to go back and transplant in a couple of years. So, so hopefully that helped a little bit. Yeah, it does. Um, we've had a lot of questions about deterring animals from your edible plants, like birds from eating your berries or, you know, just any any critter that wants to snack on your stuff. Do you have any suggestions yeah. on how to handle that? You know, that's a tough one because I, I never mind sharing. Just don't take them all. Um, I, I'll be honest, I'm not a big fan of netting. Um, you know, we, we have bird netting here and certainly that's an option you know, maybe on a smaller scale. Um, I think you'll find a lot of birds with their heads stuck in your netting if you net everything. And that nothing makes me sicker than walking out and seeing birds that have uh, are no longer with us because they got trapped in plastic netting. Um, I, I use scare tape um, quite a bit, you know, up in cherries and blueberries. If we have a flashy color scare tape, even years ago, I used to take, well, I don't know if they make them anymore, but old CDs, you know, where I could hang a CD on a little piece of string. And as it turned in the sun, again, the colors, the flashing tended to keep more birds away. Um, I would say that part for birds, um, you're probably gonna have to share a little bit. It's gonna be a tough one to keep all the birds out. If we go into deer, 
you know, other browsing type animals, um, I would get repellents, you know, you know, again, it's, it's up to you. If, if I lived out in the country out here and I had the room and I did not want Mr. Deer touching my garden, I'm probably going to put a fence up around it, you know, a, a chicken wire barrier or something to keep them from browsing on certain things. Um, if I'm in a typical city yard, deer tend to get to everywhere these days, but perhaps then I'm going to go for repellent, maybe a spray on the foliage or something on the ground as well that you can keep uh, most of the critters from going in there, uh, perhaps without, um, you know, hurting them or anything down the road too. Excellent. Um, we've talked about espalier trees a lot and there's some questions surrounding that. Um, like, do you need to support them at all? How long oh, yeah. does it take them to reach some of the pictures that you've shown? How long does it yeah. take them to look like that? You know, it, it, it doesn't change a, a fruit tree. I mean, when you come down and bought an espalier, you know, they're probably planted in the ground four or five feet tall already. And they probably got six feet across the branching. I mean, we don't get little tiny things. So they look like something off the bat. But yes, um, I have to support them somehow. If I plant a spalier, it's just going to weight itself down and frankly break the branches off because there's going to be too much weight when we get apples. So, you know, eye hooks on the fence, you know, that I can kind of run line and tie them and train them. You know, if you stop down at the nursery here, uh, years ago, Steve set up a couple of them in our demo garden. We still have pears. Come down and look at our system. We've got simple treated four by fours with some high tension wire that just trained out and they'll grow forever like that. I can prune them. I can keep them the same size. Um, you know, it's very easy for you to tell the espalier what you want it to do. Some people let the, the top tier grow up and make a whole nother one. I mean, I've seen them up the whole side of a two-story house. It really depends on how you want to train and prune them to do that way. But again, I can't say it enough. Make sure you support it with something. You're going to be disappointed in a year when all of it breaks off if we don't have it tied to something. So add a post, tie it to a structure. Um, there's a lot of good, look online, there's a lot of great pictures of, of different ways to train as polyase. And I, we can only talk about us here in the nursery and the plants we bring in, but any of these fruit trees or berry plants that people take home from us this year, are they going to expect fruit this year? Yeah. Do they have to wait? How does that work? Um, the, the berries, I would say absolutely. I mean, even the little tiny forest strawberry plants um, already have flowers on them. You're going to get strawberries on them right away. Um, all the berries will get something. We don't get little bare root starts of raspberries or anything anymore. I mean, even our gallon raspberries will produce fruit this first season. Um, fruit trees are a little different story, to be honest. Some things um, depends on what you buy. Um, some, yes, I, I might get a couple this year for sure the second year. But honestly, there's some apples that might take three or four years. I mean, it'll grow. It'll get structure. You'll, you'll be sweet. I got a happy tree but I, I need to build wood on the spur fruits. You know, if you want to go back and watch the fruit class, it's on our website. It's a little bit more in depth on the spur type fruits, apples and pears, but I have to develop that wood to get the blossom and then get, get my fruit production that year. So, you know, as a general rule, I would say, you know, the peach, the apricot, the, the nectarine, the cherries, the plums, maybe I'm waiting a year or two and I'll start to get some apples and pears you know, Asian pear is usually the first year. If it's a European pear or apple, I'm probably waiting two years, maybe three. You know, we don't get little whips. You know, I, again, not to, you know, pick on Costco, but we all shop there for different things. I've seen little five-gallon trees. You're probably going to wait six or seven years to get anything off of them at certain stores. You know, we try to get a little bit older tree here, which is going to, again, make you a little closer to, to production time. Excellent. Um, so there were some questions about, um, are there any evergreen edible plants specifically that are capable of being in containers or in small spaces or anything yep. where we can get it all? Well, I, I, you know, the first one pops in my head would be the huckleberry. I mean, that's a beautiful shrub that would never lose its leaves, evergreen huckleberry or the little box huckleberry if you want some low. Um, those would be two great choices right off the bat. If we went to kind of that partially evergreen system. Well, now we're getting into those blueberries that I showed you, the sunshine blue, the bountiful blue, um, and some of those bushel and berries. I think you're gonna keep most of the leaves on most years up here, and they typically drop them in the spring as we got all the fresh growth coming out. Are there any vines? Oh yeah, the, the last two we talked about in the slideshow, uh, kiwi and grape, you know, are two great 
vining plants, especially the kiwi um, is really aggressive. If you want to carry, cover some area, kiwi vine, uh, whether it's fuzzy or hardy, or I didn't mention Arctic kiwi would be the third one. Uh, any of those will cover up a shed. I've seen them done really cool, you know, kind of growing over a structure, an arbor, a fence, really anywhere you have. And again, as long as I train the grapes to grow up on something, I can, the grapes are an excellent vine as well. Excellent. Um, we had some questions about beneficial insects in the garden. Um, somebody specifically asked about green lacewing larvae to control yep. pests um, and other beneficial bugs. Yep. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, beneficials, um, you know, we, we always have uh, mason bees is, is kind of one end of it. We always have ladybugs. We'll have those here pretty quick. Uh, we're really looking hard at the praying mantis, the lacewing, the, um, and, and uh, what's the third one, nematodes for the soil. Um, in Washington, you know, to me, we get just cold enough in the winter, you know, with global warming, probably not so much long-term anymore. It doesn't seem like we get much winter, but you have to be careful. I, I've never been comfortable selling some of those because gr great, they're awesome for the season, but I have nothing left the next year. I got to do this every single year. I think we're getting to the point where if I added nematodes in my soil, they would migrate down below the frost level and then in spring they're right back up and ready to go to eat root weevils and take care of some of my soil problems. Um, absolutely get the lace if, if, if you can. Um, they've been hard to find this year. I think there was a real bad harvest on a lot of beneficials again, not to keep blaming COVID for everything, but I don't think the manpower and the staff was out last year doing the collecting they typically do in the summer so that we have the larvae and, and the populations to purchase in spring. Uh, we're hearing about a month late. I think it's going to be later May to early June before we would have some of those things in and available for, for gardeners. And we've had a lot of questions about how to control weeds around your edibles or slugs and things yep. like that. And I know we've yep. talked about it in different settings and different classes. Yep. So um, what's well, the good general rules or things to well, do? Well, and again, it, it's, it's no different versus spray versus what we've been talking about. I want something natural organic. I don't want metal aldehydes. I don't want poisons. I don't want any of that stuff getting anywhere near anything I'm going to eat. So slug is an easy one. You go straight for iron phosphate, sluggo. Sluggo Max, we have Bug and Slug, uh, even does more on the soil made by Bonide. Those are all totally safe things that I will get great luck with for the slug, the snail, and some of those soil insects. And I can put that right around my vegetable plants, really anywhere in my garden, um, and have great success. Uh, what was the second? The, oh, the second half was weeds. Um, again, I don't want any kind of systemic chemical herbicide at all. We don't really have anything left. Um, here that we feel comfortable selling uh, besides for lawns um, as a selective weed killer. So if I'm going for the vegetable garden spray, <clears throat> I'm going to get something natural. We've got two things in the store. Uh, botanical cleanup would be my first choice. Um, all natural oils in there and it will burn weeds and things that it touches. Be real careful. I can't spray it on my tomato, my peas or anything else. You're going to burn that as well. So be very careful when you spray. Sometimes you get a piece of cardboard to kind of protect a plant, spot spray, um, you know, that way. Even if you needed to paint it on some leaves with a little brush, we'll just keep it on that plant. But these are things that are not going to hurt the soil. They've got no systemic uh, action. And, and again, as long as I don't physically get them on to something I want to grow, I'm going to have death of grass. I'm going to have death of weed, of, of all those other things that I don't want in the garden. All right, we've covered a lot of ground today. Um, so I know that there's been some questions in the chat about is this recorded? It absolutely is. Um, we posted up to our website, like Trevor said a few times on our classes page. It should be up later today. If not, it'll be up tomorrow. Um, and we also put it on our YouTube channel. And if you subscribe to that, it'll give you quick notification when things get posted. So you can go back, rewatch, pause on some of the slides that he used today, take notes, you know, kind of reabsorb for a second time all this information, because it is a lot. Um, and we totally understand that questions come up, you know, past the class while you're out in the garden working. We're always here to help. We're open seven days a week. 
And we always have expert horticulturists on staff ready to answer questions. We've got a great team here. So stop by the nursery, enjoy the beautiful weather where we've got. Um, send us an email, sunnysidenursery at msn.com, um, or give us a phone call. You can find it on our website. We've got all sorts of people here, and we love to talk about plants, so we'd love to talk about it with you too. Um, thanks again for joining us today. Hopefully we see you around the nursery, and we'll see you tomorrow for our Colorful Shrubs class class with Trevor, uh, 11 a.m. Pacific. Standard. 11 for Sunday. There you go. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, everybody. Enjoy the sunshine today. It's a beautiful spring day. We'll see you tomorrow.